In this video segment, we're going to talk just a little bit about cut quality. You know, honestly, I could talk for hours about cut quality. There's a lot of different things that, you know, come into play with plasma cutting, depending on the thickness, the accuracy, uh, the type of material that you're going to cut. There are a lot of things, for instance, if you're using a Hypertherm PowerMax 85, that's an 85 amp uh, air plasma cutting system, but it has consumable parts that can run at 45 amps with what we call fine cut consumables, it has 45 amp shielded, 65 amp shielded, and 85 amp shielded consumables. They all are there for a different purpose. Basically, you can run everything, all your cutting jobs at 85 amps if you want to. That'll give you the maximum speed, but not necessarily the best cut quality. So if I was gonna do my best job on, for, for instance, uh, a piece of uh, 16 gauge steel, I would use the fine cut consumables, they're the lowest powered consumables. So kind of matching the power level to the thickness of the material is very important if you're shooting for the best cut quality. However, if I wanted to cut that 16 gauge steel at probably seven or 800 inches a minute without the best cut quality in the world, you just need to sever parts fast, yeah, you could do that. Um, so most people choose to go with the best cut quality at the, at the lower cut speeds there. Uh, better. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of things that have to be selected. The, the set of consumables that is used, uh, and then the machine has to set um, in, through the tool set on the CAM software on this, uh, on this Arclight machine, it actually can select the, the amperage. It can tell you what consumables to use. and also sets a bunch of parameters involving the torch height control uh, the, and the motion and uh, so forth of the machine. So uh, it, if you have the, the serial data link between this and the hypertherm plasma cutting system, you get a little bit of a level of automation where a lot of these light industrial machines, the operator has to open up a manual, has to walk over to the plasma, do some settings, walk back to the, to the screen and uh, set height control functions and speed functions and things like that. So yes, you can get some automation or for a little bit less money, you can get less automation. Uh, consumables, uh, the choice of consumables and the amperage are important. One of the things, one of the rules of thumbs that I like to mention, uh, I've got a piece of quarter inch steel that was cut on this machine uh, right here. Uh, if you want the best cut quality uh, on a piece of material, you generally use the lowest amperage process, the lowest amperage consumables and the lowest amperage to cut it. And it's going to cut it at a slower speed. It allows everything to give you a little more accuracy, a little better squareness on the corner. However, if I want a whole lot of these parts cut, I might turn the power up and, and do them faster and expect a little bit less tolerances. As I say, a lot more I can talk about on cut quality, uh, but in a nutshell, either it's automated uh, on the CAM software on here, uh, and there also are many pages in a PowerMax 85 uh, plasma cutting system, I think 32 pages of cut charts that, that help you dial in all those parameters. So plasma cutting uh, in general can cut almost anything that conducts electricity. Um, but the, since the most common um, metals that we use uh, are steel, uh, st in fact steel is over 95% of the steel of the metals that we use, but steel, stainless steel, and aluminum. Um, so these air plasma systems from Hypertherm, the PowerMax line of plasma cutting systems, are designed obviously uh, to use air as the plasma cutting gas. And air is about 20% oxygen and roughly 80% nitrogen. Um, that gas mixture is really dialed in for steel. It does a great job on steel. It certainly can cut aluminum very well and can cut stainless steel very well, but since 95% of what most people cut is steel, uh, that's where we've really focused uh, the capability of the machine. So, um, so keep that in mind. And I just, had, I just spoke with someone this morning online that uh, asked about cutting uh, copper. Uh, yes, you can cut copper quite well. Uh, we don't hear anywhere near as many requests for it, but when somebody needs some help dialing in on copper, and there are a lot of different alloys of copper, each with diff different transfer capabilities and things like that, you do have to do a little of ex experimenting. Uh, the tech service people at Arclight or the tech service people at Hypertherm can always help you uh, get started and give you a, a, a little bit of a test procedure that will help you dial in your own cutting parameters when you do run into a material that um, yeah, that isn't, uh, isn't cut on a daily basis like steel is. Um, on top of that, uh, selecting the correct plasma cutting system is very important when you're looking at a CNC cutting table like this. Uh, you can start with a 45 amp plasma or you can go all the way up to 125 amp plasma. Uh, do you need the 125? Probably not if you're, if you're a smaller operation and your materials are thinner. So the two most important things you need to know is what's the maximum thickness that you want to cut or that you need to pierce and second, what do you spend probably 80% of your time cutting? You might be spending almost all your time on 12 gauge steel and only once a year do I have to pierce three quarter inch. That'll help us help you decide uh, the best option for uh, plasma cutting power. 
not always the smallest plasma cutting system, not always the largest, uh, but let's get you in the right product that'll work for your application for many years. I'm going to talk a little bit about the consumable parts in a plasma cutting torch. Uh, a lot of people that haven't had much experience with plasma cutting uh, hear that word consumable and they go online and check all the forms and uh, they think this is a very uh, large part of the cost of operation of plasma cutting. Well that's true with some plasma cutting systems and it's true with older technology plasma cutting systems. Uh, I've been with Hypertherm for a lot of years and when I first started with Hypertherm you get about 120 starts and maybe a couple hundred feet of cut uh, with an electrode in a plasma torch and you had to replace it for about $19. Back in those days uh, the actual consumable cost was a major portion of plasma cutting. Today the technology has gotten so much better that you're going to get thousands of starts out of an electrode and, uh, and, and thousands of uh, uh, as much as a few thousand feet of cut out of an electrode. Uh, the actual cost of the consumables that factored into cutting steel uh, is a fraction of a penny per foot of cut. So it's uh, consumables cost a little bit to buy from your dealer, uh, but they last so long and you get so much cut out of them. It's really the cheapest way to cut steel uh, on the planet that there is. So, um, so we're going to take a look at them uh, in this torch right behind me and uh, see if we can uh, uh, understand the process just a little bit better. So this is a uh, this is a Duramax torch as as is used uh, on Hypertherm Powermax 45, 65, 85, and 105 systems. And the consumables are all right in the end. This is the retaining cap. This is the shield on the front end of the torch. And if I unscrew those parts, we'll take a look at the uh, all of the consumables that are inside. This is the swirl ring. Uh, this is a, it actually controls gas flow and swirl of the gas has a major impact on the life of the rest of the consumable parts. This is an electrode. The Duramax torch has a unique patented spring electrode. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that here in a second. Uh, this is the nozzle. The nozzle actually uh, takes that high uh, temperature plasma jet that we develop inside the torch and forces the jet uh, in a swirling pattern down through a tiny orifice. That increases the energy density of the arc is what gives us a really nice cut quality. Uh, and this part on the front of a hypertherm torch is called the shield. The shield works in conjunction with the nozzle to increase energy density, but also, more importantly, the shield isolates the nozzle from touching the material that you're going to cut. If the nozzle touches the material, as it does uh, in some unshielded plasma torches, you're going to have very short nozzle life. Uh, last but not least, the retaining cap uh, is a piece that directs the gas flow to the shield and to the nozzle. Uh, it also isolates the shield electrically on the front end, uh, so it has a bunch of functions. Uh, if you take the retaining cap and the swirl ring and even the shield out of the equation, these parts last quite a while. They, they last for a, a lot of starts and a lot of plasma cutting. The parts that wear out the quickest are the electrode and the nozzle in the front end of the torch. So generally, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, these are the parts that you're going to change. Uh, you're going to continue to use those for maybe 50 or 30 to 50, depending on the thickness of material you're cutting, changes of nozzles and electrodes. So let's take a look at the electrode first. Uh, the front end of the electrode, where the actual arc is developed, uh, has a slug of hafnium. It's an earth element. Uh, it's a good electrical emitter, and so it's bonded through a pat actually a patented bonding process into the front end of the electrode. Uh, and that's where the arc starts. Think of temperatures around 25,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and this is copper that melts at about 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're bending the laws of physics a little bit inside the torch with gas flow and gas swirl to make them last a long time. When do you change the electrode? Uh, you don't wait until it fails, because uh, that, that can damage the other components in the front of the torch. You change the electrode when it develops a little pit right where the arc attaches on the end of the electrode, uh, when the pit is about a sixteenth of an inch deep. There is uh, a section in the operator's manual uh, uh, from Hypertherm that describes that, and there also is a YouTube video that's put out by Hypertherm that goes into detail about the function of each one of these parts uh, and how, how to determine when they should be changed. The nozzle orifice, if you hold it up to a light and look through it or use a 10x uh, jeweler's eye loop, uh, you can look at the orifice very carefully. And what you're looking for is just that the hole is perfectly round, no nicks, no gouges in it, because this is what shapes the arc. It actually makes the arc into a very tight cylinder of high temperature gas that's going to do the cutting. So this gets changed when the orifice uh, of the nozzle is no longer round. So. Um, a lot of technology has in, gone into this. I've actually wa watched this development with Hypertherm for uh, a little over 40 years, and uh, they don't look anything like the parts we built 40 years ago, but they last uh, many times longer than the consumables that we used to have and at a much lower operating cost.